My name is Dexter Fitchek and I was a data scientist on uh, two products at Shopify called Kit and Ping. Now I'm a developer on the Shop app. Uh, I'm here to talk to you today about data bias, which is a topic I find really fascinating. I think it's even more complex in industry because in an academic setting, it's easy to kind of concentrate on one little area and it doesn't have as much implications as when you're looking at real systems that are used out there and on real people. It's hard to sometimes understand the full implications of it, and it's even harder to figure out how you solve for these implications. So I've structured my talk into just a few different sections. The first one is what is bias? Uh, the second is detection, then examples and solution. So what is bias? So just a classic dictionary definition is prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person or group compared with another usually in a way considered to be unfair. So I think this is like a great point that sometimes we think that bias is always negative, but you can also just be favoring one group and that means that all the other groups are um, in fact like being treated unfairly. So I have just this like preview right away of um, this uh, ImageNet data set, which is one of the most popular ones traditionally in computer vision tasks. So you can see that they've labeled like someone has manually went and labeled all of these images and you can see for uh, this uh, image that it actually predicts that it's a pet sitter or a critter sitter, which itself, you can't really judge a person's career just from looking at a photo of them. But also it's really interesting that this is even a label in the data set to start. So yeah, that's basically what bias is, is just when you are introducing some sort of unfair label. So next, I want to get a little bit into detection, how you kind of find these things. So the first thing is that data is full of proxy features, and these can be anything. So when you look at this, uh, just like say this was a little data set, and you have something like postal codes, you have the item purchased, you have the job title. Some of these things seem really neutral, like if you look at uh, nurse and doctor, they're actually gender neutral terms, but often people will think of a nurse as being more of a feminine term. Uh, but when you look at a waitress, it is actually a gendered word versus waiter. So you can see already in this, if you're just using job titles, in some ways you'd be introducing gender into whatever model or analysis you're doing. So postal codes are a really great example as well. So I have this image here, which shows by race different neighborhoods and kind of this, these different uh, states where they join. So you can see where there's predominantly white neighborhoods is red. You can see where it's, it's covered, but Hispanic neighborhoods is yellow and then black neighborhoods is blue. And when you look at this, you actually see that for each of these, it's by postal code, these little dots. And each postal code actually shows the general uh, dominant race of that region, which is very problematic if you're just trying to do some sort of geographical modeling, because the same would hold true for GPS coordinates, that you actually can introduce race into your models just by using postal codes or some other sort of location data. So some other examples, uh, kind of like case studies. So this one I found really interesting. It is, uh, I've heard so many times in my career, people talking about automating resume screening uh, by using machine learning. And some companies may do it out there. Some companies do keyword searches. It's really kind of a black box how it works, but everyone thinks that it could be improved and uh, you could actually remove a lot of human bias by using machine learning. So what Amazon did was they built and they tested an automated resume screening tool, and then they found afterwards it discriminated based on gender. So it favored candidates who describe themselves using verbs more commonly found on male engineers' resumes. So they actually found that males more often used words like executed and captured, and the model that they made afterwards just kind of echoed that. So when the bias was caught, luckily the project was killed off and never actually used. But this still just shows there's a lot of problems in how people like genders, different races use language differently. Also, if English is your second language or you like speak multiple languages, you will use 
those languages a little bit differently than someone who it's their native language. And because of that, if you did something like resume screening and you had typos that were more often found in someone where they were writing in a different language, your model could actually pick up on these and they could pick up on discriminating against those that English is not their first language, for example. So another really great example, and this kind of leads into the previous one, is word embeddings. So there was this paper that came out. It's a little older now, but I think a lot of uh, topics on bias kind of point at it. And it was called Man is the Computer Programmer as Woman is the Homemaker. So this is kind of uh, the classic word to back chart that everyone features. But what word vectors are is basically um, automatically computing some sort of vector representation of words. And it does that based on how we use them in language. So I think one of the original ways they did this was they took all of Wikipedia and then they just looked at what words are used together in what order. And they were actually able to create this numerical representation of each word. And if you compare these numerical representations, you found that ones that are more similar or the numbers are more similar were actually more similar words. But you could also find subtleties between them where there'd be some differences. So you could see in the first chart, man and king are kind of near each other in this um, three-dimensional space. Same with man and woman, same with woman and queen, and same with queen and king. And it's because each number in this vector representation kind of represents a different attribute of it. Same with, you can see like they show Spain, Madrid, Italy, Rome. Um, it's a country city kind of pairing showing that these naturally just by looking at how we use them in language end up having pretty close vectors. So what they found in this paper though, and the thing that's interesting about word vectors is a lot of people use them as a pre-trained uh, way to start their model off. So it already kind of has a gen general understanding of language, but these models, the vectors can be very problematic. So what they did is they found words that were really close to the word she and words that were close to, or like job titles close to the word he to actually see which job titles get just an automatic gender association, even though they don't have one. So you can see uh, like a lot of these are ones that we already have stereotypes around, which is nurse, like I talked about before, homemaker, nanny, stylist, hairdresser, receptionist. None of these are uh, gendered words in English. What happens is we use them so often in English, though, like they are gendered, that they get these associations and these are baked into this model. And then what happens is other people will use this model and they have no idea that uh, it has this kind of bias already in it. So if you use this model for resume screening already and it was looking at someone's past career or jobs, it would already be able to, in a way, pull out gender and it will use something like that as a feature into whatever model you build. And you have never coded that in at all. You don't know the person's gender when you look at it, but your model will be able to kind of come up with a conclusion. Um, same with the he occupations, you have like a, a large range, but skipper, um, architect, broadcaster, boss is a really interesting one. And it just shows how we already, when we use these words in English, have a bias. And when we build models on unstructured data like this, it just inherits that bias. So another example I found really interesting, it's called gender shades, bias and facial recognition. So there was a study done where they took um, different facial recognition APIs. So these are ones that anyone can use and a lot of companies and governments actually use these APIs. I um, mean, we'll partner with these companies. So you can actually see they wanted to look at how good is it at detecting a person's faces based on the color of their skin and their race. So what they found was for Microsoft uh, Face++ Plus Plus and IBM, they all did pretty good for darker male, lighter male, lighter female. Um, but then when you get to the darker female category, they all struggle. Um, so much to say that the solution from IBM had a gap of 34.4% of the time it wouldn't recognize a darker female, which is, this is crazy because again, you use one of these APIs for a service, so you don't have to deal with these problems. Uh, you would think that a company like these ones that are so large would look in and make sure there isn't bias in these things, but it's so manual and tedious to sometimes dig these things up that they just ship these things and they don't always think about it, especially, I think it goes to show that 
uh, the workforce for developers is still predominantly white male. And you show there, it shows that like all of these biases just kind of slip through the systems and no one catches them. So this last one I found really, really interesting, actually. Um, it's kind of a newer article. It's from the markup. I'm um, going to move this so the chart can be seen. Um, so this was called Swaying Your Inbox. And it's Google's black box algorithm controls which political emails land in your main inbox. And this is crazy because I had actually never thought of bias in something like Gmail, which I think most of us probably use. But what they studied is they subscribed to uh, the newsletters for all of these different political candidates in the United States. And then over the next few months, they looked at all of the emails that came in where they ended up uh, going. So in this, they actually focus on Democratic emails, but they wanted to see, could this actually, like the way that Google is automatically marking things as spam, have some sort of bias in it? So you can look in here and... Um, I found it really interesting that for Elizabeth Warren here, they basically received 66 emails from her over the time period. 85% of them went to promotions and 15% went to spam. So that means not a single email went to someone's primary inbox. Now, if I was interested in this candidate and same with like all of these candidates right here, I subscribe. Um, I don't know if you're like me. I never look at the promotions tab because I just assume that it's junk. Uh, same with these other candidates, but then you look at uh, Pete Buttigieg or uh, Andrew Yang and you see, wow, like a significant chunk of their emails went to the primary. And why is this? And if you look, there's actually no female candidates here that had uh, like over 2% go to uh, like the primary inbox. So when you look at that and you look at the candidates that did the best, uh, we now know that they're actually not in the running anymore. But you can see that this has an impact on how people uh, interact with uh, political candidates. And the way that Google does filter these things is changing kind of our decisions over time because we're learning less about campaigns we maybe were interested in and more about ones that we initially weren't. So what are some learnings from all of this? So. This is kind of about how I go in to uh, kind of find when there is bias. There isn't like a lot of great tools out there, but I want to highlight a few that are really interesting, but there isn't one tool that's going to make it easy for you. And this stuff really slips up in organizations because you can have something ready to ship and you can just ship it, or you can spend another month looking for problems with it. And if you find a problem, you're then stuck waiting and spending another month doing it. So I think a lot of companies specifically, and it might be unintentional, don't look at this. And by doing that, they're being complicit and putting bias in their models. But for them, it's a lot easier to just not know where these biases exist. So I start with analyzing prediction quality amongst different segments. So it can be tricky to sometimes find data sets. And sometimes this means labeling your data sets even further to try and get groups that it could have a bias in. But there is this great tool called the TensorBoard What If tool. So it kind of shows you if a feature was changed, how would it change the predictions? And then it will group them. The other thing I really like to do, and this is probably the best starting point, is just come up with hypotheticals of where bias could be, then try to evaluate them. Chances are, if you can come up with three or four uh, different just hypotheticals that might seem a little extreme, there probably is those biases and it's a lot harder to prove them, but it's easier once you come up with a few theories. You need to have more diverse data for training and evaluation. I think that the uh, face uh, recognition example I had before is a really great case where they didn't have diverse data and they couldn't tell that it was diverse, I guess, by how they trained. Because if they had had extra labels on like demographic or race, they could have actually broken up their predictions afterwards to see by each race, what's the quality of the prediction. Um, and ironically, IBM has a data set for diversity and faces. So it's a little ironic that their API actually struggles with this. But there is actually data sets out there for this. So when you're building some sort of model like this or just consuming an API or using some sort of pre-trained system, you could still go and evaluate these sorts of things afterwards. You should also look at correlations between segments. 
such as gender, age, and features. So where you do have something like gender and age, which you should actually ask for, um, so you can analyze this, you should then look at, of all your features, which of them are correlated with gender, which of them are correlated with age, and they might actually be proxies for that. And what that means is it's just some sort of hidden representation of it. And it might mean dropping extra features that make your model seem more accurate, but introduce this bias. One thing I really want to highlight too, and this is an interesting thing because I've heard so many times people say, like, we can actually predict race, we can predict uh, gender. Like I even showed you could actually use postal code to kind of come up with what race someone might be if you have that data. Um, ethically, I really believe that it's wrong to do that. You need to, if you're going to analyze something on someone, you need to have consent to use that data. And what this means is sometimes you will get data that is uh, kind of murky. People might not respond truthfully to it. But I think if you want to be ethical while being a data scientist, you should be using data that people give you consent to use for this. Um, and a lot of companies think it's a can of worms and will avoid collecting this type of demographic data. And what they're doing is being, again, complicit. Because if you don't have demographic data, it's really easy to not have to worry about analyzing your models based on uh, demographic. But once you have it, you're able to actually see the decisions you make and where uh, gender, race, and like many, many other features can come into play. Another thing is you should explain or understand how labels could contain bias. In this example here, they have is again from the ImageNet data set. There's this great write-up just about all the problems with ImageNet um, called Excavating AI, I recommend checking out. But you can see one of the labels they have here is Ball Buster and Ball Breaker. You can see these are just photos of women. Someone has went and labeled these and has decided this is what a Ball Buster Ball Breaker looks like. These are really problematic, these types of labels, because you are just allowing someone to put this stereotype in. This might seem like a really extreme case, um, but there's a lot more that are subtle. And that's what makes it hard is that if I look at something here, there's like divorcee, uh, I'm trying to see what else, but there's a lot of things where people might not think they're problematic and they seem really subtle. But then when you actually look into um, how will people make decisions on what this looks like, it's very complex. Uh, and you should evaluate the impact and implications your systems have. I think a lot of people really like the idea of having these flashy machine learning models and recommendations based on like people's age, gender, um, all of those things. But there's a lot of implications of these things. Um, they might not operate better. They might discriminate. There's so many unknowns with them. And I think to be really thorough, you really have to do this analysis so you can be confident in uh, whatever your organization is putting out. And lastly, I think this is, I can't highlight this enough, is to build diverse teams because everyone has different backgrounds. Um, everyone grew up in different places. They grew up with different uh, first languages. They grew up in different types of households. One person cannot find all the bias in a system. Like there's so many different experiences and I can try to have as much empathy as I can and I can try to read as many books as I can on the topic. But ultimately you need to have diverse teams and diverse experiences because those are actually the ways that you will find when a system um, underperforms in some areas and uh, is biased towards different groups. So I cannot drill this enough that without these diverse teams, you will not be able to remove a decent amount of bias from your systems. So um, I want to, uh, as a, like a too long didn't read, if you zoned out, this is just for you. So you really need to understand your data, where it came from, the types of labels that it has, uh, and just everything about it to understand before you even train a model, is there some sort of bias in your data? Uh, there are specific things you can do to reduce bias, and it's just a lot of research and being aware, but it takes time and effort. The last point is there is no band-aid easy fix. Bias will always be there, but you can mitigate its impact. So do not think you can like, again, read books. You might hear a startup pitch to you that they will help you have a like gender neutral system. 
there will always be some sort of bias. And the reason is because someone is always making the, de the decision on what is uh, fair and unfair. So you need to make sure that in whatever you do, you are mitigating its impact when there can be bias. And you need to just be always aware of how over time your model will change and start to be more biased. If you made a model in the 1950s and the things that people would have thought are okay then, definitely are not okay now. And you need to bake this into your system or you need to always be evaluating this and come back to it and setting up tripwires, especially if you have online learning systems where uh, they're constantly learning over time, you need to be able to set monitors for if suddenly its predictions are changing for some sort of demographic. These are the sorts of things. Um, and it's not easy. There is not an easy fix for this, but I really appreciate the time that you took to come and listen to my talk because I think it's a really interesting topic and we all need to think a lot about it in the da data science profession because in when you do an engineering degree, you take an ethics course. When you uh, do data science, you've come from so many different backgrounds and you likely have not taken an ethics course. Um, and just one course isn't enough. You need to really understand the implications of things, even though your organization may not be a fan of it. So I wanted to highlight a few tools that I think are really, really kind of cool and things that you can look at. Um, so IBM has this actual AI Fairness 360 toolkit, which actually has metrics and ways you can evaluate um, and try to seek out bias in your systems. Um, there's this really great page called Google ML Fairness, uh, this TensorBoard What If tool that I talked about, the IBM data set. I actually didn't realize when I first started preparing this talk that the government of Canada, where I'm from, actually has this responsible use of AI page um, with different kind of like ways to evaluate if you are being fair and responsible. Uh, excavating AI is where some of these ImageNet things came from to show the bias, isn't it? Two books, which I highly recommend, they're both really interesting on this topic. Um, the first is Invisible Women, and it's about collecting gender data and how the lack of it over time has created basically a world that's built for men. And Weapons of Math Destruction, which is uh, focused on all kinds of case studies of where uh, algorithms and systems all over the world have uh, basically fell short and discriminated against groups. That's my talk. Please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, on LinkedIn if you have any questions or if you ever want to talk a bit more about this topic. I think it is the data science community and different leadership that really is our responsibility to keep this moving forward and keep uh, the conversation going. Thank you very much.